to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Welcome to IEP Radio. This is episode 19. Today we're going to be talking about contents cleaning and a review of mold contaminated fabrics. To help me with that topic, today I'm going to be speaking with our special guest, uh, Dr. Ralph Moon who works for a company, GHD, who's involved in operating in the global markets of water, energy, resources, environment, property, building, and transportation, and uh, where uh, Ralph has over 16 years of experience working more in the insurance claims work. He's had over 2,000 insurance claims, and he deals a lot in the industry of um, water damage building and that sort of thing where um, among other issues, he, he was involved in research dealing with contents and fabrics. And I, I originally reached out to Ralph because um, I first saw his name in an article that he wrote. It was a, a paper in a magazine called Cleaning and Restoration uh, back in 2004. You'll, you'll learn more about that in the uh, interview today, um, where he talks about cleaning methods for porous items, namely pa- uh, fabrics. And this experiment, the study that they had uh, done um, using different fabrics and different cleaning methods and their outcomes. And what I loved about the article, which ended up being kind of a two-part thing, was that he looked at not just the physical removal of mold structures, but even mycotoxins. And um, it just, we know here on IEP Radio how challenging the topic of cleaning fabrics are. Uh, Probably 95% of the folks that I get to work with always bring that up eventually. Uh, What about my contents? Are they contaminated? Can I clean them? And it's a really hot topic because I think at the end of the day, there is no guarantee because uh, having a guarantee or being able to provide one would insinuate we know what constitutes success. And that's very difficult to do when we know that we're living in a world that there, you know, mold grows everywhere. It's part of our ecosystem. Without it, we wouldn't be here. And, you know, you could coin the term normal fungal ecology. And again, what's normal on a t-shirt? We all agree that a t-shirt shouldn't have mold uh, growing on it. But if you have some spores or structures or even background mycotoxins from the outdoor environment settle on that clothing, does that mean it's contaminated? So again, a really challenging topic. And I'm absolutely honored and um, looking forward to this interview with Ralph. Uh, where we kind of dive into the details of that study that they performed. And if we have time, we're even going to get into a little bit more topics having to do with some uh, lessons learned uh, with his career and helpful tips for you to consider. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Moon. How are you doing today? Doing good. And I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to go uh, on IEP radio with us. Uh, Really excited for today um, uh, of the podcast that I've done so far. Uh, and certainly on a general list of topics, probably one of the most hotly debated one deals with contents cleaning, especially when you deal in the realm of fabrics and, and that sort of thing, uh, porous items, um, and, and hoping that the audience today can learn a lot more about that topic and um, have the opportunity to listen to a lot of the research that you've been involved with and your background. So I think I think one of the challenges, and I know there's more than one uh, due to this issue of what's clean, what's not clean, what can we clean, what can't we clean, is because we have moving targets. We don't know how to say 14 spores of a particular mold, as an example, is not contamination, but 15 spores is. Or if it's growing on an item versus it's settled on the item, does that make the difference between whether it's quote unquote contaminated or whether or not it's restorable? And then you get into issues with health and everyone is susceptible and in various ways. Um, so when, when, when we are working with clients who have experienced a loss, say due to a water intrusion or even a damp environment, oftentimes porous items such as fabrics have been exposed to the same environment. Right. And it's the question is to an unknown degree. Uh, we hear and deal with concerns and claims of whether these fabrics were impacted and if so, can they be restored? Um, and in fact, it was a study uh, that we'll be bringing up shortly that you wrote and did in 2004 uh, in the Cleaning and Restoration magazine, where you in fact did test fabrics that were not just exposed to moisture, but inoculated with a couple of well-known mold species. And then through uh, that experiment, you tested various types of more common cleaning methods and their ability uh, to restore. 
Um, you not only use scanning electron microscopy or SEM and culturing to analyze the various fabrics, but you even came out with a second part to that study that following month in the, in the magazine, as it were, uh, which was, that was November 2004, which involved a review of mycotoxin exposure to these fabrics and, again, the various cleaning methods and their ability to remove them. So mold structures and mycotoxins, a couple of hot buzzwords uh, in our industry, and it's this onion that I'm wanting to try and peel with you today to discuss in significant part the research you've done, the pearls that you learned, Okay. The limitations about that study as you understand them, and maybe what questions are still out there today. So with that being said, look forward to having you maybe kind of give a little bit of background about how the study was performed, and, and we can let the conversation go from there. Okay, so this was one of the first studies where I was actually invited to uh, prepare a scope of work and conduct the research on behalf of the at the time, it was the Fabricare Institute in Maryland. And um, I think I must have been referred to by a, a restoration industry re a representative. And they called me, I flew up to Maryland, and we spoke about the design of the experiment. They were concerned that, much like you've described already, is that many of their members were recommending their use of, of dry cleaning to remove mold from fabric but they had no technical basis to do it. And so that's kind of the impetus for nearly all the research we've done. But what distinguishes this one is actually I got some money to reimburse me for the costs, not for any salaries, but for the costs to do the re research. And it was performed with my colleague, uh, Dawi Lee and Chin Yang up in New Jersey, both were at, at, um, at P and K, uh, K Microbiology, now a different firm. So the first step, in preparation for this research was to get the proper fabric. And uh, you just can't go to a fabric store and buy some fabric and use it. Uh, the Institute provided with me with standard fabrics, poly, uh, polyethylene, silk, wool, and cotton that they use for their research. And the, uh, the Fabricer Institute is now called the Detergent and Laundry Institute. They've moved, but they have the same basic function. They do research on behalf of various manufacturers and detergent manufacturers to figure out what works best for cleaning fabrics in both Europe and the United States. So they provided the, these, these standard fabrics uh, to do the research. Uh, and I, once I brought those back to Tampa, our scope of work was then to um, subject them to conditions of elevated moisture. Um, and we thought that if we inoculated them with um, aspergillus and and stocky batteries that they would simply grow. And I think one of the interesting milestones that came out first in the project was about a month after the, uh, the materials were wetted and inoculated with the fungi, um, fungal spores, which uh, Dr. Chin Yang prepared. And by the way, we, we inoculated with millions of spores. Right, put it in perspective. But they're in there, they're millions of spores. And after a month, nothing grew. And I was, oh my God, I can't believe this. Nothing is growing. Now by visual, is that not to interrupt you, by visual standards, you didn't see anything? By visual standards, I saw nothing. And I Got think it. a picture of that in the front. Right, right. There we go, right here. I thought, oh my gosh, these guys are paying me to grow mold on fabric and I can't even do that. Right. So uh, I talked to Chin and I said, why is this not working? And uh, again, the first milestone in this issue of content cleaning is that mold grows on surfaces that it can derive some nutrients from. And, it, and in this circumstance and in many others that we find in our work is that if a, a viable spore alights on material like fabric that doesn't contain any nutrients it can extract, it won't grow. Right. And so you know, fungal spores don't break down silk, they don't break down wool, cotton, or polyester, certainly none of the man-made fabrics. So we had to supplement it, and we did so with a, a dilute a mixture of Gatorade, and that provided enough sugar just for the, to activate the spores to start to grow. And so that was an interesting finding, but something we see repeated over and over again in our work in, say, flooded, uh, flooded situations or homes that have high humidity. And as we go through the closets, 
will you know thumb through the ties and the vests and the shirts and the pants, and we'll find that uh, if we have if we have fabrics that have not been dry cleaned or not cleaned, is that we'll find a proliferation of growth, principally in ties where they've dropped some food on the material during the course of a meal, and that makes perfect sense because it can't break down silk, as is the component of the of the of the tie. The same thing is true for suits and pants and so forth. Usually you find the growth where there's some source of nutrition. And that same thing applies for leather couches, furniture. I mean, where do you see the mold? You see it where the armrests allow the accumulation of oils and skin and so forth. So, to, so as to provide some source of energy for bacteria and fungi to grow. So all that makes sense, but that was the first milestone. So once that was, once we got to grow, uh, we, we allowed to grow for about two more months. And uh, I, I did that portion at the university in a fume hood. For those who've done research with mold, it's remarkably smelly. Mm -hmm. If it's wood, if it's uh, gypsum board, if it's fabrics and so forth. So it's difficult to do this type of research in an area that isn't, doesn't have some of, a, of good ventilation sure. because of the odors. And, and for me, it just drove my, drove my secretary crazy <laughs> for other experiments we did. But the point right. is a well-ventilated area. So, um, and, I, and so as this progressed, we recognized that there was you know, prolific growth on, on, on these fabrics. And the next step was to take them out. And uh, I flew up to, back to, New, New, up to uh, Maryland. And we had a huge table to work with to to place them under three different, actually three or four different scenarios. We wanted to see how effective these four different control fabrics that had now been impregnated with fungal growth, not just of Stachybotrys and, and Aspergillus, but all the other endemic control species that we see in the slide here, uh, that was, we were actually quite, uh, quite diverse. And what's interesting is that the species we saw grow on the fabric are those that we commonly see in our own uh, evaluation of tape lift samples from uh, you know, homes have been flooded or have been exposed to elevated humidity. So uh, we took those up to Maryland and uh, we separated them out into various groups. And then one group went just to perchloroethylene treatment, uh, common dry cleaning. And the other was a petroleum ether, also called martinizing. Right. They also washed some. Uh, with bleach, I believe, and then the third was wa uh, washed with bleach and uh, bleach and or just washed with, with uh, detergent and then washed with detergent and bleach. And so then, what, what was one, that's actually an important part as a clarifier, one was laundering and then the way you say it in the study was laundry with bleach. Correct. So the one that was just laundry, uh, we're just talking like a, a name brand um, detergent that you would buy at a store? Yeah, they had a control surfactant they used for research at the institute. Okay, we used that. It, it was a you know general, um, you know ionized uh, ionic surfactant uh, okay. used for clothing for for clothing. Right. So for the purposes of our discussion and the audience, we don't have a specific name, but we'll just call it a standard representation of maybe your average detergent that you would otherwise buy. But the point here is without bleach, the other one was with it and with bleach. Right. along with the dry cleaning methods, which were there were two. So okay. after they went through the treatment, they were, um, I, they were dried. Okay. And then we, we cut out pieces uh, to be sent to a laboratory um, so that they could evaluate a couple of different things. The first question was, how effective was the removal of the, of the um, spores and the hyphae when they were ex uh, among the different types of fabrics after being exposed to different types of cleaning methods. And that effectiveness was revealed pretty distinctively in that the overall, the laundry and laund launder, so detergent with bleach and detergent alone were the most effective removing from, from cotton, silk, uh, wool in part with, with the bleach and polyester. So those common cleaning methods that we use, I think, were very good. The petroleum ether was the worst. And I'm not really sure why it was so bad, but I'm not sure if it offers the same 
molecular structure to extract uh, oils and greases and, and of course different spores and hyphae as, as compared to say the perchloroethylene, which was much better. Right. But the point was this, is that there are huge differences in the effectiveness of cleaning methods. And at the time, uh, restoration contractors were promoting the use of dry cleaning of contents twice to remove mold. And uh, clearly it is effective, but the, the ones that were the most effective were those that were just used to perchloroethylene. Yeah, eff effective. And um, uh, I was, I was going to say, it seems like it depends obviously a little bit on the type of material, but hands down, it's looking like laundry and laundry with bleach, uh, arguably with the exception of the polyester. And I don't know if there's a reason for this part on the lower left of the screen there, but it looks like it was hands down the better option right. on average. It's just simple cleaning works great. Right. Now, some things you can't, you can't, you can't wash, you have to dry clean, but Nonetheless, right, sure. the vast majority of things that we might find in someone's home, if you can lawn, if it can go through laundry, it's a great choice. Right. Uh, so we also looked at it. I was curious because I had access to a scanning electron microscope across the street from our office. <clears throat> and I knew the technician, so she was always willing to accept interesting projects. And so we looked at the fabric before and after cleaning because we recognized that some of these methods can be kind of destructive to the structure of the, of the fabric. So in this comparison, we've got, uh, and it goes, it goes 5A, well, we have the, the four different combinations we have in the upper left, we have silk, uh, the control, that's, that's perfect. And then we have upper right, we have a, a, um, we have a control at a thousand, and that's the same material, but a higher magnification. Then we have, in the lower left, we have the test, meaning after it's been cleaned, and then at, we have a magnification. Of course, the magnification shows that there's residual microbial growth afterwards. Right. So that was the, that was the intent, to have some visual cue rather than just the cultured samples to demonstrate that, that they're present. The same thing's true for the next four, but those are uh, for polyester, not uh, silk as in the upper four. Right. And so that same thing. There's a disruption of the of the fabric with cleaning, and there's still residual materials that was present afterwards uh, under the highest power of the of the microscope. Mm -hmm. So it was it was interesting to be able to see it. Right. Exactly. So and that's what continues down as we go further here. Yeah, with the rest of the materials. The, that upper one is the uh, is the cotton, and that's followed by the by the wool. Okay. All have different chemical structures. Uh, different, you know, uh, aesthetic feel and so forth, but nonetheless, they all have various consequences when they're exposed to mold with regard to their ability to be cleaned effectively. And I think that that for most consumers, we thought this was helpful because there's kind of a unspoken promise that one, when one sends in materials, clothing to be cleaned, and you know that there's mold on it, if that vendor promises to remove the mold, then there's some ex expectation that they will. And what we realized from this is that, you know, for the most part, that's a very difficult um, uh, objective to satisfy because from a microscopic perspective, it's still there. But more importantly, it's still viable. And as in part two, we learn more about mycotoxins, the mycotox mycotoxins were still present. So that was an that was a interesting uh, finding. Yeah, and if you want me to jump into the mycotoxin part two, let me know. I'm just kind of flowing down on the order of the study here. So, sure. so in this case, uh, we were looking also at the strength. And the, this, we did the strength study only on the wool. And we found that when we compared the controls to the, uh, the strength after testing or after cleaning, is that strength diminished. And that's not, you know, that's not an unexpected finding, but the point is that for some of these materials, when they're repeatedly washed over and over again, there's a subsequent change in the strength of the material. Right. But you could argue that whether, or this is a question, you could argue that whether there was mold growing on it or not. If you wash something over and over again. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think that the thing that's interesting about this is that we have to realize that there are consequences when we attempt to put a lot of energy into fabric materials to remove something. As, as a consequence, we're also changing the strength of that fabric. And so, you, as you might imagine, uh, under the microscope, we could see that the hyphae were wrapped around 
the uh, strands of cotton, for example, much like a grapevine wraps around yeah. the support for the, for the plant. And it would take a lot of energy to remove those hyphae from the cotton fibers uh, based on our understanding that they're literally wrapped around the, the molecules of, of cellulose. So that, that was pretty interesting. And it gives us some credence that, you know, it's tough to remove mold from fabric. Yeah, and and key there for the audience members is, to, and, and and this is the part, Ralph, where you tell me if I'm wrong, but mold growing or growth. It's not we're not necessarily talking about a mold spore or a mold structure that came from another origin and landed or otherwise settled on this fabric in question. We're talking about the difficulties to, to completely remove uh, stuff that has been shown to actually grow on the fabric itself. Clearly, there's effective measures. It's this whole question of how effective. Yeah. It's part of the challenge that we're dealing with. If we were dealing just with the spores, and again, I, I'm just, I'm speculating because we didn't test just the addition of spores, we actually grew it. So we right. had hyphae in addition to spores. But if we just added spores, like you're walking out while you're, say, cutting the grass, and you're exposed to billions of spores while you do simple things like raking and cutting the grass. So those, that, those clothing elements, I think it'd be washed, could, you could remove those spores quite easily. Right. Well, and we'd have a big problem if that wasn't the case, because I know that some of this is ancillary and, and, and subjective, and, but we apply this thing called common sense. And that's the issue is even as we've been talking, there, there are mold spores, mold structures, uh, dare I say, mycotoxins that have landed, sure. uh, it, however they may, on your shirt, it, just in the discussion here from the outside. And it doesn't mean that it's growing or 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 contaminated your item to a level that's unrestorable. Maybe before we get into the nuggets and the takeaways, we can transition now into part two, because I think we're, we're the, the conclusions are similar on some things, and I'll let you elaborate on this. So then the next month in November uh, is this, this article that Ralph and others had wrote, which it's focusing now on the word that everyone hears, everyone talking about, which is mycotoxin. What do we learn or what do we do on this study that's a little bit different from part one? Well, as with most research studies, you know, when you, when you set up you know, the project design, you want to squeeze out as much information as possible because you can't go back too easily. And there's always some nuggets you wish you had looked at. And this is one of those little nuggets that I think Chin Yang suggested in that we analyze for the presence of mycotoxins before, treat, before cleaning and after cleaning and we throw in some control fabrics into the washing machine and then test those to see if there's transfer. That's brilliant. What it showed is that we had, we had put a, a large concentration of mycotoxins on the fabrics to begin with, uh, based upon the, the cultures that we had for aspergillus and sake batteries. And we recovered a much smaller uh, volume uh, afterwards, but nonetheless, it, it remained in the fabric after cleaning. And that was kind of a surprise. It's one of those little nuggets you, you, we just wouldn't know. And quite frankly, the vast majority of questions that we currently have about research, including contents, we just don't know. We're just, most of us are just guessing or making a, a, an educated guess. But until we do the research, we don't know. And this is an example of that. And then, uh, then we looked at the clean fabrics that were washed or placed with perchloroethylene or or perk or uh, petroleum ether in the other uh, areas and found that it was transferred. And that was, that was a surprise too, because we thought there'd be some effective removal of the mycotoxin in the rinse water out the discharge. And so that was another interesting finding in terms of the attempt to satisfy the consumer with regard to cleaning their fabric, their clothing, and one of the outcomes was that, you know, if you're going to choose to wash or dry clean fabrics in a commercial facility, make sure that you don't include any other fabrics with it from another person because you may transfer my mycotoxins to them. Right. I think it's fair to explain to the, to the person who's asked for materials to be clean is that we can't, we can't, guarantee that all these materials will be removed, all the mycotoxins and spores and hyphae, is, it'll look great. And by the way, it did look per very well, very good afterwards. It doesn't mean though that from the naked eye, you can tell 
the presence or absence of mycotoxins, which are, of course, on a lower than a micron scale in terms of size. Sure. Um, jumping around maybe just a little bit, um, what I do see, though, and maybe, again, you can help elaborate, is we do see reduction. Uh, go back to table one here on the screen right now with after cleaning, again, the different methods that you, we, we talked about earlier were applied. And as, as far as I'm reading this, I'm seeing that laundry and laundry with bleach, with the exception of silk here, uh, it was pretty darn, maybe a little bit of wool, was pretty darn effective compared to what you guys know was actually applied to begin with. Am I wrong in that thinking? No, no you're right. And, and of course, one of the biggest uh, distinctions, of course, is the effectiveness of the, of, the, of the surfactant. I think that has a huge role in why laundry and laundry with bleach is so good. Uh, okay. Kirk and the pet just didn't do that well. And, and by the way, I, I gave this presentation at a restoration conference in, in, uh, in Philadelphia about two months after this was done. And they, their mouths were just gaping because they had <laughs> no idea of the ineffectiveness of the dry cleaning, although that was the predominant method of cleaning at the time and, and may still be. But nonetheless, it was a total surprise uh, that, this, that this demonstrated the ineffectiveness of, of the dry cleaning, but the effectiveness of the laundry. Right, and, and, and so many nuggets here of, of, of wisdom and, and lessons learned is you have a freight train of industry standards and, 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 and responses and perhaps the mouth, you know, the jaw dropping to the ground was the idea that you're really suggesting that the, the train is going the wrong way. And, 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 and just to also recognize that there are limitations, but I think the limitations need to be taken in consideration with other factors like the fact that you're not, when you buy that t-shirt from the store, it's not, uh, mold structure or mycotoxin free. Um, I, I'm, I'm not saying that one shirt in the world doesn't exist, but mold is part of our surroundings. It's part of our ecology. Without it, we wouldn't be here, ironically. So we're going to have what we would call normal fungal ecology. And maybe you could say that we'd have a normal settling, uh, although that's the point is it's a wide range. Somebody wearing a t-shirt in the Sahara Desert versus somebody that grab, uh, jumps on the, 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 the garden tractor and starts you know, cutting grass may have two different uh, concentrations of significance that they have. But we get into these things of that's the challenge with this topic is when people are dealing with chronic illness and we apply that angle of this and saying, well, we've had a, a water incident and we're trying to clean our contents. We understand that traditionally non-porous items can be wiped down or otherwise restored but that when we get into this big topic of porous items and there's, you're thinking about the shoes, you're thinking about the fabrics and maybe the, the, the bath towels, that is it cheaper to throw it away or, or that's the whole point is it's not. And I want the audience to, to remember, because this is all relative, is Ralph is talking about items where they inoculated it with mold and eventually got it to grow and it didn't happen instantaneously. So maybe you can see a lot of thick silver lining in what he's telling you. I, uh, I'll let Ralph be the, the, the person to, to state what he learned because he did the study. But what I learned from the study, and there's a lot to be learned yet, is if the items have been wet or longer for then more, say more than two months, you kind of get into this kind of point of no return, at least from the study that you did you ended up finding either residual mycotoxins or you ended up finding structural components of the mold or evidence that it was still viable through the culturing that you guys performed. Um, and, and if you're trying to define pre-loss, meaning what did the item look like prior, can we restore it to that point? Your study loosely argues that no, after a certain set of time, the studies that we did to effectively, quote unquote, try and remove contaminants was ineffective through your metrics. You're, you're looking under a microscope. You're mm -hmm. testing for mycotoxins. You're testing, you're culturing and looking for viability using uh, more than one auger to look for growth. And if it was less than two months, it seemed to have a higher chance of success to be removed and that's the silver lining is we, we try to work our way towards a more exacting answer for our audience of where do you draw the line. And I think anytime you see anything that smells musty or there's microbial uh, growth on it, I mean, Ralph was just mentioning that he had to do his experiment in a hood. Uh, right. You can see that hood on the top of the, the second study right there. Um, and 
that that might be the line of delineation where you say, this is not worth me restoring, or at least not dealing with right now, because meanwhile, you're dealing with a house that was flooded or something that's a lot more significant than a $20 t-shirt that's in discussion. Um, if the item, however, doesn't have evidence of growth on it, which is, a, is, a, is an observation, doesn't smell musty, um, and perhaps the leak that happened was a plumbing leak that you got on with within a, a week or less, let alone two months, there seems to stand to be a, a, a claim here that those items are more likely to be restored to a, an acceptable level. Acceptable is what we would think would normally be on that t-shirt just from the surroundings. Is that too far of a stretch, that last part, Ralph, that well, I think, I think all the things you discussed are, are questions that we can kind of speculate on. I mean, the, the issue of the duration that the, the content has been damp or has been exposed to spores. I mean, for me, we used two months because I had to, have a, I, I had to make sure that it was actually growing some mold. But what you've described are some of the interesting um, questions that are derived from any research project. You, do, you answer one question and you, you initiate 50 more questions. Right. So that's, that, and that's typical. I mean, if you don't yeah. do that, I mean, something's wrong, but, but oftentimes is that the research never is, you really can't stop because there's always more questions that evolve. Now, take for example, this project, we looked at four control samples with four different cleaning methods uh, for, that have been exposed for a two month period to various uh, fungi that were endemic to essentially most environments, it's a fairly common fungi. But there are a lot of other variables, like for instance, would a fabric that was dyed, would that, does that offer any more opportunity for something to be broken down? Can some of those fabric dyes be utilized? For instance, plant-based dyes uh, that you might find in madras clothing, is that more predominant or would that provide more opportunity for energy for fungi to utilize? I don't know. Oh, that's um, a great question. Is there, is there a possibility, like we found uh, also that steam pressing the garment after cleaning reduced the viability down even further. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool because it means that even, even if you don't do a, such a great job with the perchloroethylene, if you steam press it afterwards, at least you're diminishing the viability even further. And I thought that, well, that was an interesting finding because it was actually quite effective in reducing uh, 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 you know, culturable fungi afterwards. Right. So um, I think another thing that, that came up was with regard to, uh, there, there are so many multiple different types of fabrics nowadays, cotton blends with yeah. cotton, polyester and, and, uh, and uh, man-made. The man-made fabrics in general behave very nicely because the structure of the fiber doesn't really provide anything for either bacteria or fungi to grow. So all of us with our Under Armour shirts and so forth that are, that are man-made, they generally look very good, even years after you know, multiple uses and washings. It's the cotton, the wool, the silk that, that might diminish more rapidly. But then those blends uh, that may in incorporate dyes and so forth, those are interesting aspects to look at. Say, for example, with drapes in homes, you get those funky little yellow spots on drapery uh, in homes when they've been exposed to elevated humidity. I don't really know precisely what that composition is, but is there something that can diminish the capacity of that drape to support mold growth when exposed to elevated humidity? I had, uh, I'm not sure if you were at that talk, Mike, or not, but I spoke with Chin Yang in Orlando on this topic, and one of the guys in the audience was from NASA. And, you know, one of the uh, resounding themes of spacecraft failure for long-term space missions is not usually mechanical, it's biological. Right. It's that the interior environment becomes contaminated with fungi. And we're talking about contents. Yeah. I mean, not just the contents that they're wearing, the silk underwear and the uniforms, but all the instrumentation. So with regard to the future of this type of research, to me, what's really exciting is saying, okay, so let's say we, we, we want to in, uh, in begin involved with content problems for space travel, which is inevitable, I think, in our society, then what can we do now to understand what are the best fabrics to wear and what can we use that, recognizing that they will sweat in space, what are the least likely things that would support growth? 
And that was a major problem on board spacecrafts uh, back in the early days of, of uh, various uh, space missions. So the application, are, are there's just a thousand questions that come up. These are very simple, but the point is that they, they help direct us in areas that have, have other applications and simple things that we might deal with with someone's contents when a house has gotten moldy. Yeah, and and a lot of things. Uh, great comments. Totally agree with your your comments. You talk about space travel, and as you were talking about that, I thought we're talking about Mother Nature that got billions of years to figure out how to find its balance. And if you if you don't think it's going to be an uphill battle uh, when you do one thing, what does it cause? Um, you know, what's the consequence? And yada yada yada. Um, you'd be mistaken. The the challenges here, I think taking a chance to, and I wanted to ask you a question about your personal experience. I know your background dealing with uh, claims of, you know, water losses and things and what you've seen. Um, but I think it's because no, no one doesn't have, no one has a direct line. Like there's not a threshold sharply that says, like, I think people here listening can understand the concept that if there's no mold growing on a t-shirt or a pair of pants, you name it, that's, that, that's a fabric. Um, that it's cleanable. No one, if you want to get into a debate of how good the clean is, um, well, this, this study here suggests that there is a significant reduction within what they were. So everything is tested against a metric. In this case, they used uh, mycotoxin testing and the part two kind of gets into that a little bit. Um, culturing and scanning electron microscopy, um, which is their metric to define success in a cleaning method. Are there other methods? Could we talk about qPCR, which really wasn't even commercialized when the study was out, um, mm -hmm. and, and things that maybe there were fragments that were present? Sure, I'm sure we could. But if we give credit where credit is due, I see, and what I've recommended for a long time, although I, I have not recommended bleach, that was the eye-opener for me, was I have recommended laundering per normal manufacturer standards. And for most items that's just laundering with your household detergent that what you would use because you hear all these claims of adding all these other things and I'm like where are you getting that research from you know where, where's the study that shows that that's actually good and then it sets up people's mind frames of thinking they have to do all of this or else it's going to be impossible and yet they still want to guarantee so for those that are listening I think the nuggets you can take away here and, and Ralph you are absolutely allowed to uh, disagree with me is nothing's a guarantee However, holistically, I think it's a reasonable claim to make that if an item doesn't have visible mold growth on it, it doesn't smell musty, if the water leak has been something that's happened, let's give them a month. If they've had, if it's been something that was exposed less than a month, that there seems to stand a chance that there's a greater likelihood that you can clean this item and restore it to what you might define as a pre-loss. Um, if, if there's any item that's in question, or obviously there's an item that did have growth on it, you can see from what Ralph has shared with us thus far that it, there is effectiveness to reduce it, but it may not return it to total pre-loss, and that may be an issue for you if you have a chronic illness. Does that mean that the conclusion is to throw everything out? No, I, I don't say you should do that, but perhaps what it means is cleaning the items, whether you use normal laundry detergent, and I don't, was there a ratio, by the way, of amount, the amount of bleach? Am I putting you on the spot, Ralph, of how much bleach you used? Well, it was intended to follow the directions of the manufacturer. So there was okay. nothing unusual about the amount that was added that you might normally add based upon the directions for, the, for bleach. So, th so following those directions that if you wanted to try that, you can. I understand that there are people who are chemically sensitive. And I know that some of you may be listening and going, wait, you guys always talk about not using bleach to kill, but we're talking about building environments and source removal and things like that. Whereas right here, we're talking about contents and trying to do what we can to uh, otherwise physically remove or eradicate what is clung onto that clothing. Um, and I think this is great information because there's really not a lot of studies that are out there that I think were as robust um, I think I give credit to you, of course, but Dr. Chin Yang for thinking about the mycotoxins and even part two, I, I have to admit, uh, this transfer of mycotoxins from um, a con what was a laundry cycle that cleaned contaminated clothing into a new load and there was definitely a transfer. Now, we have to keep in mind, we're not talking about a heavy transfer, but there were detectable amounts of mycotoxins in the nanograms uh, category that were detected. So is the takeaway what Ralph said earlier? Yes, it's separate known contaminated items from non. Other, how about this for a consideration? Stay away from public washing machines 
And another thing may be to consider running a dry cycle in a washing machine, meaning don't put any clothes in it, but to just run, say, hot water uh, without any clothes to try and purge what may be residual in that canister. But know that nothing is a guarantee, no matter what you do. Am I wrong with that? No, no, you're right. As a matter of fact, you reminded me that you know, one of the, the, the two things that are really filthy in our society. The first thing are gasoline handles. The oh, great. Handle, yeah. That's the yeah. filthiest thing on the planet right now. The second thing is probably your, your uh, clothes washer mm. uh, because we tend to close the door when we're done. It stays wet and damp, and, and we've you know, done some, some testing of that and find active nematodes growing inside Ugh. the washers. But my point is that, and you brought it up, is that when, if you're into cleaning, a commercial cleaning, is that make sure that your vendor is rinsing out the 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 instrument it be a per uh, a, a dry cleaning instrument or a, a washing machine he rinses that make sure that's clean before he washes again because talk about cross contamination is an excellent opportunity for that i'm great wondering- point i'm trying to think about what other nuggets there were ralph with the study that you were, were willing to share before we go into those other articles that we had talked about prior to getting on any other nuggets you want to share with the audience? I mean, this, 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 these articles are great uh, for those of you that are watching. I know some of you are listening, um, but you got to look at this video cast uh, so you can see the actual screenshots and you can pause the screen and read it. I mean, they're just excellent. Well, I think that one of the, the themes that, that came across for me that I think about a lot, besides the fact that clean fabrics don't support a microbial growth, is that and many times uh, after, if you're, if you're doing consulting or restoration contracting and you're going to homes after hurricanes, after floods, storm events, or water releases, is that you will begin to recognize, if you're sensitive to it, those, those contents that are supporting microbial growth and some that in the same home absolutely do not. And so I'll give you an example, one striking content it was a, a woman's home that had an ongoing leak for like six months in her home. And uh, she was concerned about her furniture. And that's in the same category of, of contents. It's not fabric, but it's furniture. And she had polished. She had some furniture. She loved to polish because it was right in front where all the, her guests would sit. And she had others that were covered by a linen cloth that were not polished. Mm. Now, remarkably, after the water event, the polished furniture was covered with, with mold. It, this was the nice stuff that she was very, very proud of. Whereas the materials in the back that were covered with linen were not. They had nothing. I mean, moldy, nothing in the same house exposed the same conditions. I thought, why is that? So I uh, did some talking with my colleagues, and in particular, Chin Yang. I said, why is that so predominant on the materials that she did not wax and clean and so predominant on those that did? He said, and and again, you'll see this when you do restoration, is that the materials that were polished with the wax regularly condensed surface moisture when the, the unit went through the diurnal changes of temperature from cool during the evening to warm during the day. The water condensed on those materials that did not allow it to be absorbed, yeah. polished. Whereas the wood that was not polished, the water was absorbed, diminishing the water activity, no mold. Two, yeah. Water activity got low enough, mold said, oh man, we can't play and didn't grow. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the issue of mold growth, and we've talked primarily about fabrics, and the fabric side is driven principally by nutrition. What type of energy sources can you find that may have promoted it, typically through spillage and accidents during eating and food consumption and so forth, especially on pants and armpits, crotches, that's all sweat and so forth. But as far as contents, other than that, it's primarily driven by water activity uh, on uh, chairs and and, uh, not not fabric covered chairs, but chairs and tables and dressers and so forth. So there are different there's different chemistry going on, different psychometrics going on with different types of contents that help to explain the presence or absence of mold. You, you brought something up before we went uh, live um, 
and it feels like a good segue. Um, you know, there's so when we talk about water damage building or damp buildings, um, certainly a lot of us can think about a plumbing leak, a roof leak, a flood um, that occurs. That seems to be a great example. But a lot of folks don't always consider just their living conditions where it's damp. Say, for example, if you live in coastal Florida where you have almost a tropical light. A condition where ambient levels of moisture are typically elevated, let's say compared to Arizona. And this example you talked about, enough moisture being available in the air and this polished furniture not allowing the, the moisture to absorb uh, and instead almost condenses or makes a higher level of walk, uh, water activity present. We get into this issue of, of, of keeping the environment dry. And I know that that's not the main topic for today's uh, interview on keeping the house dry. I think the takeaway we can say is you you want to keep your house uh, dry within reason. You hear discussions about somewhere between 30 and 50 percent relative humidity uh, having to do with the forgiveness factor. Um, sometimes if you go too dry, you get into issues of uh, viruses and other issues that could increase and in, in, uh, due to cross-contamination from you, your skin flaking out, yada, yada, yada. But in that conversation, sorry for the long way to get here, Mm -hmm. um, you started talking about your own observations and you brought up this article on hoarding. So we, I, I want to tie this into the transition is, is we've gone from fabrics uh, to um, trying to minimize the potential for you to have mold problems on items, especially fabrics and stuff, so that you don't even have to go here in the future and, and, and have concerns for that curtain or the clothes in your closet. Can you share with the audience a few minutes about the hoarding article and what you learned or what you wrote about? Well, uh, hoarders represent about five to seven percent of our population. And interestingly, the older the population gets, the higher the number of, of hoarders represent men and typically single. At least they, they become single typically when they're when they're hoarding for very long. <laughs> right. So <laughs> the, the point is that you know, when someone hoards, uh, and, and it's all kinds of materials. In this case, this guy hoarded electronics, but it can be newspaper, it can be milk jugs, it can be cardboard boxes, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that when we do that, we reduce ventilation. And when we reduce ventilation, we in de diminish the capacity for water to evaporate. So if there is a diurnal change in moisture content, just driven by temperature, as happens in all of our homes during the course of a day, at the home, the homes that hoard, especially those that contain a high cellulose content, like with papers and boxes and so forth, they're going to retain moisture, and they're they're going to gradually support a, 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 a patina of microbial growth, be it on fabrics if they're if they have nutrition, and on paper and boxes. So the point is, is that hoarding is a risk, not just to the physical risk, but it's a risk to air quality uh, because of the accumulation of all the surface area that now gains moisture content and then supports microbial growth. So mm -hmm. if you're the res restoration contractor and you, you recognize this, you, know, you wanna wear appropriate protection when you walk inside these places, despite the fact the homeowner may be perfectly happy, uh, is that they pose a risk. And when there is a water release, not only can you can't tell, but uh, there's often a great deal of proliferation of microbial growth in unseen in unseen areas you can't easily gain access to that tends to drive the concerns about odor and moisture and and, yeah. and mold growth. Absolutely. So so keep the house cleaned up. Um, uh, I know that uh, hoarding is. I think as of, I even heard something recently is it's actually been an official diagnosis and, and I know that it can be an illness and I've actually worked with clients that uh, you probably would label as hoarders and I know it's, um, it's, a, it's a touchy topic and, and that's not the point of this, but from an environmental standpoint, we know that all that increased surface area and what this article does a great job talking about can lead to some of this long-term microbial growth uh, months, years, and, and then people are scratching their head. And by the time they figure it out, um, they're looking at something that lies these pictures, probably um, yeah, my first reaction when I see these photos is just a sense of being overwhelmed right. and uh, it, dealing with, imagine somebody who had a chronic illness and as an IEP <laughs> coming out here and going, um, I don't even know where to start. I don't think sampling is where we need to start. I think we need to declutter. I mean, there's just some low hanging fruit here because we've learned 
I mean, and it's not even just about mold. I mean, uh, I, I, I doubt that this individual uh, dusted their house on a weekly basis mm -hmm. and you get into particulate buildup and, and, and this, this total package. So uh, as we tailor right back into uh, fabrics and contents, um, you know, airflow pays a, a, a part in this. And when you restrict it, and you create all these surface areas and all these uh, materials that can absorb moisture long term, it's a problem well, um, or can be. The interesting thing, Mike, is that this is a covered loss. I mean, if you had a sudden event okay. or you know, some event that one couldn't differentiate as short or long term, most likely the insurance company is going to cover this loss. And the homeowner, in many cases, wants these materials returned to pre loss condition. So the restoration counter is now stuck with a whole variety of contents, quote, both metal, wood, glass, ceramic, paper, plastic, to restore. Now, hopefully, they'll, they'll discuss the possibility of, of diminishing the volume here, but nonetheless, you're faced with the same problems uh, to restore these materials, like the sofas and so forth, uh, as if it was just a normal house with a, with a water release. So it's just much more complicated with a hoarding house. No, well said. Um, Ralph was also kind enough, uh, seem, and I know we're good on time, so uh, to share with me a couple other articles that he had brought to my attention, and they may not necessarily be specifically related to part one and part two of the fabric studies that Ralph had done, but I thought it was worthwhile. Could you talk to the audience a little bit about uh, this uh, journal article that came out of the IICRC and what, what you wanted to talk about, uh, just the nuggets to share with the audience from your lessons and, and experiences? Sure. So we're often asked to help explain uh, the circumstances after a restoration contractor has restored a home and six or 12 months later, the homeowner comes back to the restoration contractor and says, hey, I've got mold again in my home. I don't think you did a good job. I want you to repeat it or find the source again and so forth. And the point of the article was to provide some armor to restoration contracts to do a good job, but help ex help to explain uh, to the homeowner, preferably not going to litigation, that there are reasons why mold grows back even after an effective remedial effort has been made. And so this goes through a couple of things that are very frequent, but may not be aware of by the homeowner. And let's touch upon a couple things. Sure. Let's start out with some things that are kind of unusual, and that's the thermostat wiring. Now, we don't think that the way that a thermostat is, I think it's point number two. Oh, sorry, let me get up there. The way that a thermostat is wired to make a big difference, but it has a profound difference because if it's wired in series, in series, then it means that both the air conditioner and the dehumidifier have to be called upon for them to activate. And so if the temperature remains below the set point temperature, it's, it remains humid. If right. they're wired in parallel, it means they can operate independently of a much greater control over the humidity in the home. Another so your point, your point real quick, just for the audience, um, is to consider that you want to have the ability for your, say you have an inline dehumidifier to operate or function independent of uh, the cooling cycle uh, because your cooling cycle may not get all the moisture. And if you're dependent on a, a, a temperature set point and it's been satisfied, you still can have creeping moisture levels get up here and we're right back to this picture uh, or similar situations long-term. Exactly. And it's most predominant in what they call the shoulder seasons. And that's during the fall and the spring when the outside temperature is kind of near the temperature that's comfortable, like 72 to 77 degrees when things just don't turn on very much. Right. The other one that's very common, I think most people are aware of it now, is fan in the on position. That's number one. And we find this so often where someone moves from the north to the south, they are used to having a fan on to provide, quote, ventilation. But in a humid environment, like in the southeast in particular, you want to avoid that because when the fan is on, it has a tendency to re-entrain the moisture on the evaporator coil back into the house. So it never quite dehumidifies very well. And in many cases, we'll run the humidity up to maybe 72, 75%. Although the air conditioner is running, it never really dries out because the fan keeps staying on. So 
if it put in the auto auto position, that works just fine. And and there are so many people that argue why they need to have the fan in the on position, but auto is the place to be. Uh, let's just just check one more here before sure. we go. Let's see. Oh well, another one that's real obvious, uh, especially in retirement communities, is the size of the HVAC system. And you know, I think most would recognize that the sizing of an air conditioner is 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 very critical. It has to fit the 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 sensible and latent heat load of the home and the size of the home. And by a general rule of thumb, it's roughly six or seven hundred square feet per ton of air conditioning, for example. Now, sometimes retirement in retirement communities, older people tend to uh, ask for a larger system to be, to be cooler, especially in the summer. And it can be also obviously among other people too, but I find it more common in retirement communities. So they'll put a half a ton or one ton larger than necessary. So as a result, the system short cycles. It doesn't operate long enough to extract the moisture. The humidity is raised, the contents get moldy. They get a patina of growth, and then you're called in to fix the problem. Right. And, and that's, that's very common, too. Absolutely. Short cycling is a huge – it is a balance, uh, I think, from the standpoint of uh, the whole concept of moisture and water activity and how that translates to microbial growth is there, there's no gray area in terms of the concern. I think what we get into is the complications of – um, is there some way to find the best of both worlds? Like if you did going back and I, not to get into a debate, because I certainly respect the research that we are showing here, but if you run a system fan on, but you are regulating the moisture properly, maybe it's through supplemental means like a inline dehumidifier, then maybe you gain the benefit of better air filtration. So you're filtering the air because you're running the system fan. And, and so I guess maybe the nugget I want to throw back at you is it's a balance and it's figuring out, are you taking care of the moisture or else, as you've described, if you don't do it properly, you may be creating a bigger problem than you not getting enough filtration in the environment. Meanwhile, you're creating a very moldy one. Mm -hmm. So balance. No, and, and I, I uh, learned like the front of my house where it gets solar gain where the sun hits is, is usually drier than the back north side where it's shaded and it's cool. And so I run a dehumidifier in the back of the house, which always fills up by the end of the day, although I do have a properly sized HVAC uh, tonnage of four tons. So the point is that, you know, within the home as re restoration contractors, we want to walk through that threshold in the front door and, and, and bring with us knowledge that has an idea, that we have an idea of how the house is performing. So if we understand how it's performing, we have a better way or better understanding of how to address not mold now, but mold in the future, should it come back. And absolutely the point of this article is give, give us some armor when we walk to the door that there are other reasons that can cause mold to grow than looking to me as not doing an ineffective job. Absolutely. Um, last but not least, um, you sent me this article, uh, K People Claims. I uh, thought it was a very good, interesting uh, topic. Uh, give the audience an idea of what this is about. So what we find as a, a, a very common circumstance in homes is where there's a tendency to shade the home on the outside with, with extensive landscaping or to install effective shutters or blinds, sometimes both, in all the rooms around the home to shade the introduction of, of, of solar, solar light. And I think from, a, from one perspective, one might think, well, if we can keep the sunlight out, then we can, it'll be cooler and more comfortable. And indeed, that does work very well. The problem is that your HVAC system is designed for a particular load, both moisture load and heat load. And when you diminish the capacity of the house to gain heat, then you diminish the frequency with which the HVAC will meet the set point temperature and it will dehumidify less often. So over time, it becomes cave-like, cool, damp, and, and humid, you know, and you'll get a patina of mold growth. So if you go up to one of the other pictures of that, we have a picture of a, of a multi you know, apartment complex, and we, we can drive by these places, and if we know the orientation, if the unit on the left side is facing north, 
that'll always have problems <laughs> because it shaded from above. I mean, it's got a unit above, it's got a unit to the right, and the left side's facing north. It doesn't have a chance. Right. I mean, it, it's going to be difficult to manage moisture with a properly sized HVAC here unless you provide supplemental dehumidification. But and let's and let's clarify just for ten seconds. There's different walks of life. Uh, I hail from Arizona. Right. Uh, our moisture levels aren't the same. Ralph is bringing with him uh, arguably uh, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, his CV speaks for itself. But you are talking about uh, more humid climates just for the audience. I mean, for those that are living in Arizona, for example, I think this is a relative thing. It is. It is. Okay. And I apologize. You know, sometimes I prepared lectures and I'd fly to, say, um, Utah. And, <laughs> and, of course, the application of hot humid has no application whatsoever. Right. I'd have and reverse things and explain it, but you're absolutely right. We're talking primarily about hot, humid situations that are most vulnerable, I think, to this issue of interior mold growth. Although right it has the same uh, problems in, in Arizona and Southern California too, but oftentimes that's due to some type of a leakage in, in the, my claims I've had in Southern California, New Mexico, and so forth, is something is contributing to the interior and it's typically not the outside air, it's something you know, a plumbing leak. That is right. Secondary. Yeah. Right on. Um, there's such a wealth of information. Um, and uh, at the beginning of this uh, video cast, you heard the introduction on Ralph. This, this man has a, a history of, of passion and, and he's kind of one of those boots on the ground. He's in the weeds. And um, I actually first uh, learned about Ralph, uh, just my quick story from an article that a colleague and I had shared years back. And in fact, that article was the part one of the study that was done in cleaning and restoration. And it was just impressive because it, it, as, as, as clients and patients that are listening, um, they feel lost with these topics and you're not alone. I mean, even IEPs, we struggle with what is really good information. And this has been one of the most rewarding uh, interviews for me because this topic that may be very familiar and easy to discuss is very complicated for a majority. I would argue that 95% of the clients that I work with around the globe, this is the topic that we end up spending the most amount of time on and wow. deservingly so. Uh, before we go, I, I do want to uh, ask you how folks can get a hold of you. But before we do that, where do you think research really needs to go next? I mean, uh, on the topic of fabrics, what you learned and the limitations. If we had the money, what would be another good study? Is that, is that, oh, is that is a loaded question? I, I th absolutely. I think there's a number of good ones that are being kicked around right now. One is the removal of asbestos from, from fabrics. Asbestos oh, wow. is still a predominant issue uh, with all kinds of, of manufacturing and, and, and exposure circumstances. But that's something that I, I actually have a, a, a protocol designed and we're just looking for the right political circumstance. You know, research has a political consequence. Not everybody is happy when you, for example, find out that dry cleaning doesn't work as effectively as you thought it did. That's what I was thinking when you said it earlier, but oh, yeah. yeah. When, I, when I gave this presentation, someone walked to me and said, hey, you didn't make any friends today. I said, well, it is what it is. What mm -hmm. can I say? Mm -hmm. So um, asbestos and, and on fabric is an incredibly valuable uh, area of research that has not been examined. One, it's really difficult to, to um, um, organize and fund a project that has potential health consequences to the people doing the work. So you have to design a certain kind of a laboratory that will prevent you from exposure to asbestos and also the manipulation of the fabric. So it takes a little effort there. Yeah, sure. The other one is fabric and fiberglass. That's another good one because it's such a common element in our environment, and yet we frequently, uh, you know, take clothes that are contaminated with fiberglass and with asbestos, and just send them off to the to the uh, dry cleaner to clean or to be returned back as uniforms to our employees if we're in engineering or whatever it might be. There's and there's a whole whole service area for that. Uh, the other area of cleaning, I'm on the um, on the Siri, uh, the Cleaning Industry Res Research Institute. It's a it's a research institute um, that focuses on research for cleaning, not necessarily with clothing, but with buildings and schools and ed you know educational uh, uh, areas. But how do you effectively clean the classroom 
to prevent cross contamination every time the kids come in? What te what te techniques, what strategies can limit exposure of these kids to um, the, the uh, classrooms that become contaminated by multiple children going through every day? Every <laughs> many week? parents, Mary, par many parents are raising their hand right now with that same question. Right, that's right. Let me turn this off here. No, that's fine. So, and just for perspective on the asbestos, and not to interrupt, but on the asbestos and the fiberglass, I think we should put this in perspective. Are you mainly refer referring to situations of like large claims where you've had like walls and ceilings fall down and you have massive exposures or? Uh, no. Well, I, certainly that, that, that's a possibility. But what I'm thinking about is the, the cleaning industry, the, the uniform cleaning industry okay. that, that collects every week or so uniforms from thousands of people washes them, dry cleans, press them, and returns them back. Are they really removing the asbestos? Now, mm -hmm. most, as most cleaning firms are saying that they are removing the asbestos, but the point is that there's absolutely no research to substantiate those claims. Well, as you found, as you found in your story with the mold and the mycotoxins is that there are all kinds of claims, but what we are finding, and this is broad uh, observation, is that there are many companies and manufacturers of products and services that that I think what they do is um, they take a piece of something that they know. They know that this will uh, effectively remove mold, but they don't apply it to the actual application. And they make these claims and they stretch out and it's a miracle thing. And and that's why I think we're cut from the same cloth when it comes to uh, our, our ethics and, and asking the question of, is that really applicable here? And look at what you found in your two, part one and part two study that caused a few draws to drop, I would argue probably worse and more than that. But yet it speaks truth because unless you have something to trump, I think one of the best phrases I've heard is show me the data. Right. You know, it's like, I, I'm, I'm open-minded today. This is how we test for mold. If tomorrow we need to do it differently, show me the reasons why. We are learning uh, tip of the spear, talking about a, 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 a mycotoxin on a t-shirt. That's, that's not what we were doing 50 years ago. And Mike, there's another reason too, is that most of us in our careers tend to ascend to the expert witness category as we gain more and more knowledge. And without that research armor, you're, you're, you're going to be very ineffective. Right. And the point is that if you do have it, then you can continue to ascend in your professionalism and also your knowledge about these topics that is really needed because there, there's no room for guessing in the courtroom. And um, I think that that's probably why there's satisfaction among people who do research, because they can use that uh, if, it's been, if, it's, if it's been legitimized in peer-reviewed publications to explain their opinions with greater success. Well, absolutely. And even today's podcast is just a, a tip of the iceberg of what we're talking about. Um, and Ralph, speaking of which, um, I don't know if what I'm about to share right now is the appropriate site, but if people wanted to learn more about you, is this one of the ways that they can learn about kind of what you've written about, or is there a better place to go? Well, th this has all the, the technical articles that we published through uh, Claims Management Magazine, but okay. the, the ones that are uh, peer-reviewed are all with the American Society of Civil Engineering. Okay. There's about 15 through them. Okay. And those are those are those are stronger articles because although I had people peer review these, that that uh, the claims management magazine is not a peer reviewed magazine. Gotcha. So, so the ASCE is really uh, the best tool, and if if you're interested, just type in type in my name, yep. and you should be able to get a reference as to a lot of the things we've written. Uh, with regard to the engineering. Any other thing I should add here? We're going to demonstrate to the audience what we're doing here. Ralph Moon, PhD. What else can I add? That should do it. Okay, so let's see what we get. You tell me. Okay, so uh, there's some podcasts. I'll keep on going down if you want. Uh, let's go to, let's go to number two and see if we can find anything. All right, let's do put it. Down, uh, put down ad um, uh, Forensic Engineering Congress. You're going to ask me to spell in front of everybody. All right. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So I got something there. Here we go. Proceeding. That's it. That okay. The, the, uh, there it is right there. That, that's the most recent one. I think we have six papers in that one. Okay. In this, in this Congress. We had five in 2015 and we have three in 2012. 
Gotcha. So a great place to start. And am I guessing we don't have to necessarily go through all the motions, but go to the search button and then uh, they can look up your name and see a lot of the research that you've done. Correct. Correct. You okay. Work, but the point is that it's worth it because it's a, it's, it's peer reviewed and it's, it's being, it's being read. I think the last time I looked at the frequency, it's been read about 2000 times. Okay. <laughs> Well, and, and I think after today's talk, uh, people listening, that number will go up naturally. Uh, Ralph, um, any, any nuggets of information you want to leave our audience members with? It's not, not that you haven't given us a ton today. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, and there's so much on here. Is there anything that we missed? Well, I'm sure there's a lot that we missed. Well, I, I think that with regard to contents, going back to the theme of the, today's discussion, I think that it's always better to help make decisions that are based upon published research, not just on my own, there's, there's other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. But if, when, if you have to defend an opinion, if you're a restoration contractor and you're having a conflict with an insurance company or, or someone who doesn't wanna pay a bill or they don't agree with you, use peer reviewed journals and are their articles to support your opinions. You'll find much less resistance when you can show that your opinions are, are supported by published research. A very powerful suggestion made by Ralph for those of you that are struggling maybe with your own insurance company or your adjuster um, and you're looking to have the data um, to help, um, that's, that's one way to do it. And it is a familiar, I don't want to use the word game because it sounds negative, but the process, uh, this is kind of the language you speak when you're at that level of you're claiming one thing, they're claiming another, and it's like, all right, what's your proof? What's your proof? And right. You have so much available here. There's many uh, articles and even our discussion and the articles themselves, which again, if you're watching the video cast, you can watch and pause as you need to, to read through the article and see the references that Ralph and others that wrote it uh, are referring to. And this is an article that he wrote back in 2004. So I know there's more stuff that's out there, but what I liked about this particular study is knowing what I know about contents cleaning, I still think it did a really good job providing realistic measures of cleaning and realistic outcomes and helping inform the user that there's never gonna be a guarantee. Welcome to chronic illness, welcome to exposure, welcome to mother nature, but there does seem to be some effective measures with cleaning items that have not been exposed to stuff this long. Ralph, I get that question all the time. We've had a water leak that occurred in a bathroom. It happened for a day. Uh, restoration efforts were um, begun within two or three days, uh, completely dried out, whatnot, within four or five days. And these, these individuals are inherently worried about contents from that event that mm -hmm. occurred. And, and they weren't directly exposed. It wasn't like clothing laying down on the floor that got wet. These were something that were 10 feet over in a bedroom closet. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping that the narrative here is that you can hear two folds. One is that there isn't a guarantee, but there's some reasonable rationale to suggest that those items are not an issue or an unrestorable issue. That's something that if you want to go above and beyond, uh, you would wash and launder your item as we've discussed here today. Right. Yeah, that's huge. Ralph, thank you again for today. It really means a lot. Um, I'm sure uh, there'll be other opportunities uh, in the future to talk about other topics. There's so many. I'm looking at your CV right now. It's pages long. Really appreciate it. I know you're a busy man coming on today on IEP Radio and uh, look forward to uh, talking with you about other topics in the future. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks. Take care. The content of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. 
In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.